Well, hello and welcome uh, everyone. Welcome to our second Herb Beef Dialogue for 2021. A particularly warm welcome to Ibu Helianti Hillman uh, and also Acting Consul General Ibu Muniro uh, and Professor Andrew McIntyre as well, all, and all our guests from Indonesia, Australia and beyond. I want to acknowledge uh, that many of us today are here on unceded lands, and I want to pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the stories, the traditions, the living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on this land. Uh, just a reminder that this uh, event is being recorded and will be available shortly on our website. Now, to kick off this dialogue, we have a few uh, words that our Dean of Arts, Professor Sharon Pickering, has kindly put together. So, thank you, Lauren. And the Dean will welcome us any moment. Here we go. Salamat Sore. My name is Sharon Pickering. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts at Monash University. And a very warm welcome to you all joining us this evening for this Herb Faith Dialogue. And it is entitled Indonesia's Indigenous Food Revolution, Opportunities and Challenges. I would like to begin by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land I'm talking to you from uh, this evening and to also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and especially my respects to any First Nations people joining us in this webinar this evening. I'd like to acknowledge Ibu Muniro Rahim, Acting Consul General of Indonesia for Victoria and Tasmania, Pro Vice Chancellor for Indonesia, Professor Andrew McIntyre, Director of the Herb Beef Centre, Associate Professor Sharon Davies, to all of my colleagues who are joining us this evening. Friends, I welcome you all to this dialogue. It is wonderful to have you joining us here. These dialogues are a really important part of the work of the Herb Faith Centre, a centre which is really focused on the people-to-people -people relationships between Australia and Indonesia. And I am thrilled with the energy and drive of the centre at this important time, when unfortunately our ability to move across and see one another in person uh, is indeed limited. So this, uh, this event this evening, we are thrilled to be joined by Helianta Hillman, founder of Javara, of Javara um, joining us from Indonesia via Zoom. So let me introduce you a little bit to Helianti. Who, she was born in East Java and brought up on a highland coffee plantation. She studied law at Pajajaran University and then continued her studies at King's College London, taking a master's degree in intellectual property. In September 2019, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development announced seven e-trade for women advocates from the developing world. The awards were announced on the periphery of the UN General Assembly in New York, and Herlianti was one of only five winners. In 2014, she was Forbes Indonesia Global Rising Star, and in 2015 was recognised as the Schwab Foundation's Social Entrepreneur of the Year. Since 2008, she has been working as a consultant for the company she founded, Javara. Javara Indigenous Indonesia is inspired by Indigenous farmers and food artisans striving to preserve Indonesia's food biodiversity. They use modern technology to manage both their supply chains and its sales. The business's mission is to bring Indigenous Indonesian food products to the market. This event is really about showcasing Monash's global engagement with Indonesia, our nearest and dearest neighbour. I am so pleased that Helianti has agreed to speak with us this evening. And again, I welcome all colleagues and especially our Global Studies students who are participating um, in this event. It is so important that the Australian-Indonesia relationship is the heart and soul of us developing our students here at Monash for the global world that they go out into. So my warmest welcome to you all, to Helianti, and my very best wishes for a terrific dialogue. Thank you.
Uh, well, thank you, Professor Pickering, for taking the time uh, to welcome us all. So now I would like to warmly welcome Ivo Helianti, who we're all here uh, to listen to tonight. And before I give the microphone over to her, we're just going to play a short video that really sums up really nicely all of the work that she's doing uh, with Javara. So we'll have a short um, um, overview of, of Helianti's work. to your work and, and showing your passion really coming through the Iwur Helianti. So I would love to turn over to you now and let you share with us a little bit about your journey uh, and about your life's work. So over to you, Iwur. Thank you. Thank you all for having me here. It's a great pleasure. Um, and, um, and actually, um, Melbourne is always like a familiar for me uh, because actually even my sister did her master program there and I visited quite some time and I have a lot of great friends there. So um, let's look back into 12 years ago when we started the company because when, um, as you probably uh, hear from the explanation that actually I used to be a lawyer before and uh, I got engaged to this whole uh, fascination on indigenous food is because uh, I did some pro bono legal work uh, for the farmers that were criminalized by exports company. Uh, but because I love to travel, I love to cook. Uh, so when I visited uh, this network of indigenous farmers, I sort of like become like a kid going to a um, toy store. So I got so excited with all the flavors, the ingredients that I saw that I've never seen before. Um, and I, that was the time that actually I learned that Indonesia used to to have 7,000 different type of rice varieties. That's only rice. Not to mention the edible roots, the spices, the herbs. And I just don't know where to start, actually, I have to say. And the, the growing concern is because most of these ingredients are 
forgotten, marginalized. They have no access to the market because the market is disconnected for, from our heritage food. And the farmers, uh, the indigenous farmer that's still growing it is because, you know, it's just part of their tradition. It's just, or even it's widely grown. Uh, it's been there for, you know, for generations and they might consume it only for their own purpose. So I don't know whether you managed to get the slide presentation I sent. Um, if, if it's possible, I think Lauren has been downloading it. Uh, meanwhile, you know, um, so 12 years ago, uh, after this uh, fascinating uh, encounter, because um, even before that time, actually, I have traveled to around like, what, 30, 45 uh, countries. And because I'm a foodist, I always visit it, you know, like the local market, the local ingredients. I always, you know, try to taste different kind of ingredients. Um, and when I started to visit this network of Indonesia's indigenous farmers for three and a half months, we did roadshow, uh, me and my husband, um, we felt like it would be a great loss for this country, for this nation, if these ingredients are forgotten. So, I think the moving point for me was this message from the old farmer. He said, we have been given this heritage and Indonesia should not be malnutrition, there should not be poverty if that heritage is managed well, if the knowledge are not gone if the people continue to grow what we have. So actually it was a challenge to me. It was a challenge addressed by this network of indigenous farmers that probably they're around 70s. And most of their children, they don't work in the farms anymore. They left the villages. Sorry. Oh, take your time, Heliante. I mean, your passion for this shows through and it is, you know, speaking truth to all of the things that have, have led to such struggles in the food industry. So absolutely take your time. Yeah, thank you. So basically, it was more like a mandate that was given to me. Their mandate is very simple. Forget about us. We're already old. We're not going to be around forever. But the particular mandate is how to pass on this heritage to the next generation because they believe that what has been given to us will be beneficial for the nation and they believe it helped us to have our sovereignty in our food supply and that nobody is left behind of getting a nourishing um, food in the table. So it was actually, it looks very simple, but when you really get into it of like, oh, where do I start? I don't know where to even start. I don't have a food industry background. I'm not an agronomist. All of a sudden, I received this heavy burden of mandates to carry it through to the next generation. So being a foodie, and I love to travel so much. So I told them the only way we can keep it alive is if we bring it to the market. The only way, if we want to sustain it to the next generation, let the market participate through consumption. Because we believe when there is a sustainable consumption, there will be sustainable production. There will be incentive for the farmers, for the food artisans to continue keeping it alive. So basically, that's, that's how we started. So we realized that actually nobody knows about it anymore. So that's why we call our mission as rebranding our indigenous food. Um, so can we go through to the next uh, slide, please? <clears throat> so since then, we have this mission of sustaining the forgotten food biodiversity and indigenous food culture. How we deliver a good food, a good health, and also at the same time, a business with purpose that are impactful impactful for the farmers, impactful for the environment, as well impactful for the global consumers who actually are looking for a healthier options uh, that addresses the global uh, diets. Um, can we have to the next slide, please? 
so when when I was um, traveling uh, through uh, you know through Indonesia and visiting these indigenous uh, farmers, I was exposed to all beautiful ingredients, which you know probably a lot of us are not even you know have tried or even have seen it or a lot of it they think that it's just a wheat you know that it's you know it has no use at all but actually it does and many of it are super food so uh, i'm can you just skim through all the slides i just want to show you how diverse is indonesia in terms of the ecosystem landscape so there is no one single word that explain our ecosystem we have such a so diverse ecosystem where in each of this is basically like a supermarket. You can find any type of food in this, uh, every type of ecosystem. So we have, you know, food in the mangrove area, peatland area, forest area, um, even the savanna and the dry land. The problem is only one, we lost it. We lost the knowledge, not only that, um, not only that, you know, uh, we lost it because of many issues, but also basically, practically the knowledge itself is gone. So can we move to the next slide? So we started 12 years ago with only um, 10 farmers, eight products, and now we have grown into over 600 products, uh, tens of thousands of farmers. And I remember the first time we started to sell the product, it's basically like, you know, door to door to friends and family, you know, all this kind of thing. But now, uh, through dedication and through resilience, because it was not easy, because basically bringing forgotten food to market, which you know nobody knows about it, is basically it's sort of like a very daunting um, mission. Uh, so basically, there's a lot of education that you have to bring. So that's why it's very important for us to rebrand it to make it relevant for the current market, because otherwise nobody is going to take a look at it. So can we go to the next slides? So um, right now, practically what we presented is Indonesia's indigenous products that has a global context. It means it has to be relevant for the market. Uh, it addresses the global diets. It addresses the, you know, the, the growing trend of the lifestyle. Uh, and it has to comply to the global standards. That's the only way we can work on bringing back the indigenous food. Can we go to the next slide? <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, practically this is our um, small store uh, in South Jakarta, which basically we call it as one store, one archipelago, because basically it represents not only products from uh, east to west of Indonesia, but also it represents products from a different ecosystem. Can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, practically now we work with uh, hundreds of products. And it's very interesting because now uh, we have uh, customers coming in, we have clients coming in, you know, either they are vegan or gluten intolerance or they have diabetics or they have cancer, which basically the solutions of the healthier uh, food is basically lies in our heritage uh, of Indonesia's food biodiversity. So can we go to the next slide? So the questions you might be asking, how did we do it? So this is just a simple profile. We have right now 392 active SKU, the active one, because we have more, but it's mostly seasonal. But you can see the profiling there is either gluten-free, it's vegan, halal certified, organic certified, superfood. So I think you, you might be familiar with this, you know, because you've seen it a lot of probably you yourself or your friends or your family are dealing with these diet issues. So when we are bringing our heritage to something that are contextual with the two days issues, then that is your opportunity. <clears throat> yes, can we go to the next slides? Yes, uh, we go to the next slides again. So the question is what, what, we, what do we do to rebrand it? So I'm just giving you just a little examples and later on I would love it more to do more like a conversation um, and I would like to listen from your side. What do you want to learn? What do you want to ask? And um, I'm sure, um, you know, you, you might have a lot of things that, you know, you want to explore. Can we just uh, skim through a bit um, so that I can show you some of the things. So first, product concept matters. How does it give the value to the consumers? whether the design is attractive enough 
to even for them to look at it and be uh, interested to buy. Uh, wh whether the size is matters and what is the unique selling proposition. So this uh, comes down to creating the concept of the product that matters. Can we go to the next, please? Yeah, so actually we play around with, you know, daily food products that are everybody familiar. That, for example, we have this chicken nugget, but the chicken nugget inside it, we have a moringa, we have got the cola, we have all these superfood that some of it are even widely grown. So basically, we're not, you know, uh, we're not intimidating the consumers with things that they don't know. But at the same time, we are reintroducing nourishing food that is part of our heritage. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, yeah, so again, as I mentioned, it's about standards because otherwise we cannot build the trust level. Everybody wants to support, uh, everybody wants to be healthy, but we have to make sure that the food safety standard has to be there because otherwise it will be, uh, it will be impossible for us to sustainably serve the market. Next, please. So um, I will share these uh, materials with you so you are free to look at it. There are many videos that comes with it. But for example, it's very important for us to build the narrative, to tell the story behind the product, to build the market trust through narrative as well as traceability. So for example, this is a forest honey, uh, which um, we have, we put in the geotech and QR code to allow the consumer to trace it, who collect the honey for them and where the trees, where it is collected in the middle of forest is located because the geotech also indicates the map. So this is one of the very small examples. Can we just uh, uh, skip through on the various things that we do? Um, so this is an example of the uh, artisanal salt in North Bali, which I'm sure you are realizing that where the climate change issue has been a daunting problem for many of our farmers, uh, producers, because, uh, because you know, they could not predict the weather. So that's why we put in the greenhouses uh, to do the, uh, the, the, the salt production to allow them to uh, do production all year long. So there are many interventions in terms of the technology as well that has to be put in place. Otherwise, there is no way we keep it alive. So uh, practically, uh, this, is a, you know, uh, this is just like a short brief on uh, what we do. And then the rest, I really look forward to you know, have you uh, and I will show, of course, some of it, you know, during the question and answer, like, for example, we are having a, you know, do it uh, yourself experience in creating tempeh, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is just one of the innovations that we do to make it relevant. Wow. That's so fabulous. I'm covering it to you. Great, great. Well, thank you for that wonderful uh, overview. And now I'd like to hand over to my two dear colleagues, Dr. Bodian Headwoods, who is the Director of Enterprise and Immersion Initiatives here at Monash, and Dr. Gabriela Garcia Ochoa, Director of the Bachelor of Global Studies. So Bo and Gabe uh, will moderate uh, our dialogue. So I'll hand over to both of you. Thank you. You're muted, Bo. <laughs> it wouldn't be a Zoom call if someone <laughs> didn't forget someone to turn to their it. microphone on. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Buhelianti. That was really inspiring. Um, but first, I too would like to just acknowledge the owners, uh, the traditional owners of the lands from which I'm speaking to you with from this evening and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, it's actually my, it's my great pleasure to open the question and answer part of the session this evening and we thank you so much for sharing your experience with us tonight. Um, I know we have a lot of young people in the audience this evening thinking about their careers and what their contribution could be in addressing some of these really big challenges that you've, you've mentioned is, as part of your talk um, and I think you've probably given them a lot to think about. But one of the big things that really came to mind while you were speaking is, is the role of Indigenous knowledge and culture and practice in developing local solutions to some really big sustainability challenges. And a big part of what you do inherently helps raise awareness about Indigenous food and ingredients. And through that is supporting Indigenous cultures and communities all around Indonesia, which is all to say is also part of a much broader food sovereignty movement. Um, 
to kickstart the questions. It would be fantastic if you could just talk to us a little bit more about the ways in which the work that you're doing um, contributes to the role of, or, or the movement of food, the food sovereignty movement, sorry, uh, in Indonesia, but then also maybe internationally as well. Yes, yeah, so um, I think this is interesting, although our approach is very market driven, but when people, when the indigenous community uh, who has been brainwashed so much with the overly processed industrial food and thinking that the traditional food is not sexy, it's not, you know, it's not hype, and they tend to, you know, consume all this uh, food that comes from, you know, uh, outside their villages. So when we, when we start to reintroduce uh, this forgotten uh, food and ingredients and, you know, making a whole, you know, hype about it, they started to realize, hey, everybody is appreciating our products. And we have been taking it for granted. So we even we even undervalue it. So they have stopped consuming it for many years. You know, even though it's there, even though it's like widely grown. So through this uh, market uh, reintroduction, basically they started to uh, reappreciate what they have, and they started to include it in their daily diets. And previously, it was not the case. You know, so I think it takes you know. Um, um, conviction from other people to appreciate it before they start to reappreciate what they have. Amazing, thank you. And it, it's really interesting to hear you talk about how the farmers are involved in a lot in, in all the different parts of that value chain, and, and that ultimately is is part of what that food sovereignty movement is 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 making sure that they are part of these solutions to really big challenges like what you're speaking about. Um, but what's really cool about this is, is a lot of the students, and sorry, I'm going to bring this to a student focus for a moment, is that they're beginning to think about their careers and they're beginning to think about what role they can play in contributing to these types of issues and some of the challenges. But I'm actually going to hand over to Dr. Gabriel Garcia Ochoa to actually now get the students to talk to you about some of the questions they have. Thank you so much, Bo, and thank you again, Helianti, for a wonderful presentation, for being so inspiring. Um, it, your, your talk was really, really moving. And uh, as Bo was saying, I have the great honor of, of being the director of the Bachelor of Global Studies at Monash. And uh, there isn't a single day when I'm not impressed and deeply moved by uh, our students who are set on changing the world and making it a better place, much like you. So uh, we have many of those students here tonight and uh, they're eager to ask you questions. Uh, so um, we have our first question from a first year Bachelor of Global Stud Studies student, Elisa Salvador. And without further ado, I'll, allow, uh, I'll let uh, Elisa ask her question. Thank you, Gabriel. And hi, Elianti, it's a pleasure. Hi, Elisa. Um, well, my question is, um, can you tell us more about how can we support farmers through the supply chains and avoid their disenfranchisement? Yeah, so uh, I think the first thing that we have to look at is to position ourselves when we become a consumer. How responsible we are as being a consumer, because practically as a consumer, uh, it's like a, in politics, you know, you have your thoughts. Uh, you can choose how to cite uh, on what kind of quality of supply chain system that you support. So whenever you are deeply uh, engaged on knowing where it comes from, how it is you know, uh, being produced, how it is impacting the farmers. So that's actually the first thing that consumers and the market can support. And second, this is in our experience. Once first we start having a consumers that concerns. First they started concerns because of their health and then they started to look like, oh, yes, I can get the healthy food, but at the same time uh, with the organic natural food products that I'm consuming, I also help the environment to heal because it's produced in a sustainable way. And then they started to look like, oh, because it's produced by the smallholder farmers, then my purchase will also support them. 
That's the first stage. The second stage, they be decided to become our advocates and promoter. They started to bring in their friends and their families, uh, not only per se about the product, but it's about the, the values, it's about how you behave, uh, your attitude as a consumer. And, uh, and along the way, some of our uh, consumers are even investing on the farmers, on the smallholder producers, because there's so much English. So basically, you can do it step by step, but at the same time, later on, they might want to go. And we, we have some uh, consumers that decided to do uh, internship with us, like three months, six months, one year. And after that, they set up their company, which mimicking the values that we have. And they, you know, work in certain part of Indonesia, work with a particular products, but, you know, they're moving it forward. So that's, that's how we see from our experience. That's remarkable. Um, and that leaves me with the question, um, how do you work uh, to engage with these local farmers? How do you bring them on board and introduce their own thing to the market? So basically, first thing first, for them seeing is believing. So you have to realize that farmers are the most vulnerable um, um, is a part of the, our society. Uh, they have a very low esteem. Uh, they don't appreciate themselves. They don't appreciate their profession. So it's very important how you put and position yourself when you are engaged with them. So in our case, we position ourselves more like an artist manager. So we are the manager. They are the artists. So, um, so basically, the concept of empowering goes both ways. So I learn from them. They learn from us. So they, we together, we learn and develop uh, the supply chain. So it's very important not to treat them only as, you know, or, you know they're our supplier. But basically, um, we also encourage what we call as rural entrepreneurship. We also encourage a fair share uh, on the ownership of the facility. So when they see that you come with a, a transparent intention and no hidden agenda, and you do it very quick because for them seeing is believing, and everything and all the decision is done together um, on an equitable manner. So it's not a problem. Actually, we have more and uh, it's more challenging for us because we have so many. Uh, farmers groups that wanted to join our system and probably like now we, we are sort of like also limited in terms of uh, resources but seeing is believing and just make sure that whatever we do we do it on an equitable basis that's wonderful thank you so much thank you Elisa thank you Elisa and thank you Helianti for, for, for phenomenal um, uh, uh, lesson the values based leadership and and full of integrity. Thank you so much. Our next question is from another bachelor of global students, uh, global studies student, uh, Nathan Waterhouse. Thanks, Gabe, and hello, Helianti. Um, I, th hi, I think what you've, hi. I think what you've achieved uh, personally and through Javar's really in inspiring, truly amazing. I was wondering, seeing as you studied law and intellectual property law in university, I was wondering if you faced any sort of unforeseen challenges or surprises when actually transitioning into a, in, in founding your own business and into the business sphere, or did you feel sort of equipped in your learning? Um, and if so, or even if not, what maybe you might, wouldn't mind sharing what the, the most beneficial things you learned were when going into the sort of business sector? Okay, when you are moving from one type of sector to another, there's a good part and the bad part. The good part, you don't know what you don't know. So basically, you tend to be fearless. You tend that you will be able to do it, you know, you, because you don't know what you don't know, right? So probably if I know that it will be hard, probably I might rethink again. So the good part is that not knowing of where what you are entering, you just have a determination that you want to be part of the solutions of the social challenge. And that was actually the driving force. So uh, given that I'm not an agronomist, I'm not a, you know, a business person. So uh, my, my father is, um, is uh, teaching um, uh, agribusiness in a university in central Java. 
So I came to him. I came to him with the concept. Look that, you know, I'm very fascinated of bringing back indigenous food of Indonesia to the market. So this is my plan. What do you think? And he looked at it and he said like, oh, you will be bankrupt in two years. I was like, what? Um, simply because there is no such market preference. Remember, this is like 12 years ago, yeah? Uh, there is no such market preference for indigenous food products in any market. So if you, even if you do a market survey, you will not find anything close to it. So um, you will be having a huge problem in educating the market and in developing the market itself. So I came to the farmers and I said like, look, um, I wanted to help, I wanted to do this, but I, I don't know whether I know to do it because I have no background. And then I, you know, I told them, you know, about this market issue that, we, and then you know what he said, what they said. Yeah. We are 70 years old and we never give up in keeping our life this heritage. You just walk on it in three months and you want to quit now. Yeah. So I was so embarrassed. And he said like, you're in much better position than us. You have access to finance. You have access to market. You have, you know, you can, you know, you can find the knowledge we need. If we don't, um, if we don't back off with this mission, why should you back off in the first three months? So I went to my mother. You know, I still need to have a reassurance. Of course, I'm embarrassed. And I said, like, okay, I have to do it. So I came to my mother. I said, like, mom, this is the situation. This is what dad said. And then this is what the farmer said. And then my mother said, and this is the best advice I got. Do not listen to your father. Follow your guts. Follow your intuition. And if you believe this is something you have to do for your life, then do it. Do not worry. Any problems, you will be able to solve it. So here we are 12 years later. We export to 32 countries. We have 600 products. We work with 10,000 of farmers. Is it easy? No, definitely it's not that easy. But every time we are in a deepest hole, I always remember that statement. Are you going to quit now? Yeah. And I just simply too embarrassed to quit. Yeah, that's great. So keeping an open mind and, and wanting to learn and listening to other people, but also following your own, your own instincts, if you think it's right. Yes. That's great. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you, uh, Helianti. Our next question is is from Laura Hain, uh, another first year Bachelor of Global Studies student. Hi, Laura. Hi, Heliante. Sorry, I'm not sure if you can see me. Um, I just had a sort of a quick question. You spoke before about some challenges with your business regarding sort of gaining all involved, like gaining involvement on all levels and sort of reintroducing um, like sort of indigenous food back into the back into the environment. I was sort of wondering what the biggest challenges were you faced building the business you have now as a woman in Indonesia and how you went about overcoming these challenges. Surprisingly, this is my least worried. So this is the least problem I have in building the business is about the gender issue. Okay, so Indonesia is very much complex. It's, you cannot define the gender issue in Indonesia in one word because we have uh, 700 ethnic groups and every ethnic groups have a different uh, um, you know, values and perception in terms of the gender. And we even have uh, ethnic groups like Minang, which basically matriarchal, uh, matriarch uh, and which the woman rules. And if we look back again in our history, even during the 14th century of the Majapahit Kingdom, one of the biggest successful port in Java for the ancient trade, the authority of the port was woman. So the authority of the port in Gresik, which is one of the uh, famous port at that time, was women. And if we look again in Aceh during the colonization era, we have one admiral which is Admiral Malahayati, which is a woman. And he runs the whole troop of, uh, of, the, of the ship is comprised of women. So yes, there are places which uh, this uh, gender has uh, issues, but when we approach it through entrepreneurship, 
when we approach it through businesses, actually it's the least problem uh, that we have. So that's why, because when, when we're talking about livelihood, when we're talking about entrepreneurship, when we're talking about innovations, when we talk about income generation, it doesn't matter whether it's men or it's women, uh, when you can showcase the impact of what we do uh, in their businesses or in their lively, uh, livelihood. So there has not been an issue. And myself, um, I've been like 1000% supported by my husband. Um, and so we, we've been quite lucky in that. But even my experience traveling from Aceh to Papua and work with so many different communities, when we approach it through entrepreneurship, through innovation, I think that would not be much of an issue. I just met last month with the head of Women Coffee uh, Cooperative in Aceh, which has been exporting around the world. And she's only like high school graduates. And she proved herself in the region that apply Islamic rules that she has no problem in running the business. She even said like she's forced to bring in 25% of male farmers just to make sure that her cooperative is not called as a discriminative to the gender of men. You know, so it's the other way around. So basically, why they manage to do that? Because they show their business leadership. So I think that's why bringing in uh, the capacity of entrepreneurship in the rural area, in the remote area, is a very uh, good element to, uh, what do you call it, to bring it on an equal basis. Yeah, that's so fascinating and, like, remarkable to hear. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Laura. And Helianti, we have another question from Pujianshi, another uh, BGS student. Hi, Helianti. It's nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question um, was, in a post-COVID-19 world, um, what actions can Australians or anyone undertake um, to contribute to the advancement of sustainable food industries? I think it's always similar with the first question because uh, I think if we, uh, first as a consumer, we acted as a responsible consumers and take part of it because basically market rules, as simple as that. So the consumers is the king or the queen. So whatever they want, whatever they decide actually change the face of the supply chain. So if you want to make sure that there is a food system changes, in our current system. So we have to become a very critical consumers uh, in terms of knowing where it comes from and things like that. And of course, being the advocates and actually right now with the digital marketing, I'm always impressed with the millennials, with the Gen Z in how they engage the digital marketing, how they master it. Because, oh, okay, this, I'm giving you an example. 12 years ago, when we opened our first store, every single consumer that walks in are either experts or those above 50 years old or those that has a cl uh, critical illness, you know, either diabetics or cancer, or, you know, they're, they're forced to have a healthier type of diet. But today, 70% of our consumers is dominated by 18 to 35. Can you see the shift of the changes? And why? Because they use the social media. When they like something, they will post it. It's different when with the oldies. They like it. They will say it by words to their friends or family, but not with the social media. But with the millennials, they use the social media and it reaches out to many people. So all of a sudden, you know, um, a product or an artisan um, producer that has not been known all of a sudden become celebrity, you know, simply by the role of this. Uh, so that's, that's how I see a lot of the uh, young generation has been contributing to the system change is by advocating it through digital marketing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Punjashi. And Helianti, we have one last question from our student, James Hanna, who's doing a Bachelor of, of Global Studies and a Bachelor of Law. Hi, Helianti. I was just curious to know, as a Law and Global Studies student, how helpful was your legal background in supporting the Indigenous food industry? Very much. First is that, I know exactly the power of branding. So every time we work uh, with a very particular origin specific, the first thing that we look at is how uh, to 
capitalize uh, on the branding, on the origin, on the narrative. So I think it helps. And second is that actually the first interaction I had with the network of indigenous farmers is because they want me to look into their contracts, right? Um, so because, you know, the contract seems to be unfavorable for them and, you know, things like that. So definitely having a knowledge on the legal contracts, um, on the regulations, on the branding, uh, and how to get, help them to realize the potential of the branding. So for example, uh, one of the salt that we sell is basic education. So uh, through this uh, geographical indication protection, uh, basically they managed to increase their pricing uh, probably by now is tenfold compared to the beginning. But of course, the branding itself is not enough. It has to come together with the capacity building to create a better quality products with uh, compliance on the food safety. So the IPR is not standalone. Yes, it's useful, but we thought other elements that help us to reach the market that it would not work. Thank you very much. But my question is, do you have an idea? Now, wait, 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 wait. I have a question oh. for you. Do you have an idea as a lawyer in IBR, if you're going to go out there, how are you going to support them? To support, um, who, sorry? To su yeah, to support the farmers, being a, uh, being a student in a law, mm -hmm. and probably learning intellectual property, what would be your ideas in supporting uh, this kind of initiative? To be honest, I'm a first year law student, so my understanding of intellectual property isn't that expansive as yet, but um, anything that I could do really would be like, I think, because I've never even thought about supporting the indigenous food industry until tonight. So my, my, my ideas about how to do it would probably not be very good right now, but it'd be very interesting to, to go into that field and to see how intellectual property and contract law can be used with the indigenous food industry and to support mm -hmm. it, especially here in Australia, where I feel that it's quite limited. Okay. Thank you. I think James might, may have felt as overwhelmed as when those farmers spoke to you, Liamti, <laughs> just now. <laughs> thank you so much, James, and thank you so much for that. that that wonderful feedback to Helianti. And now I'm going to hand this over to Bo, who's going to moderate the next uh, part of our session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your great questions. And thank you, Bo Helianti. They were inspiring responses and it's given everyone a lot to think about. Now, we, we actually we don't have a lot of time to get through the questions from the audience. And I do apologize for that. So I'm, I'm once again going to steal the show and ask a question uh, that I think everyone can take something from, and it's very quickly, Buheliante, what is your advice to students who, who really want to go out and make a difference? First, I think having, doing an internship in the area where you think you have passion, I think it will be useful because um, until you are out there and exposed to something that you know and uh, you know entice you, uh, you will not know what actually really you want to do. Because I remember with a number of uh, apprentices uh, or those who did internship with us, it's you know the whole experience was like an eye opening for them. They soon realize once you you know put them out there and expose them to the community, work with them, they soon realize to find themselves, to find you know their passion, to find you know, what they wanted to do. Um, so I think one, that's one of them, you know, and it's very important to really do things that you're really passionate about because definitely the journey is not easy. It's not an easy journey. So unless you are passionate about it, you know, you will fall out from the journey easily. So that's why, and, and it's very important that it has to be beyond yourself. Uh, you have to do it, uh, you know, I always believe that business with purpose has a much more resilience, um, has, a, has a much more, uh, what do you call it, support actually. Uh, you practically receive a lot of support with what we do. Amazing, thank you so very much. That is all from me. Sharon, back to you.
Thank you, thank you. And Helianti, I, I love that business with purpose because you're going to need a lot of passion uh, to get you through. So thank you, Bo and Gabe, and all of our fabulous students uh, who have asked uh, questions, uh, and particularly Ibo Helianti for stimulating, uh, providing us with such a stimulating discussion. To conclude our dialogue today, uh, we're very lucky to be joined by Ibu Muniro Rahim, who is the Acting Consul General of the Republic of Indonesia for Victoria and Tasmania. So I pass over to her now to give a few words of thank you and a closing. Terima kasih, Ibu. Uh, mm. Thank you, uh, Good evening, uh, Professor Sharon Peckering, Dean of Art, Ibu Helianti Hilman, um, the, ex the Executive uh, Chairperson of Jafara, Dr. Berdin Howard, Dr. Gabriel uh, Garcia Okwa, uh, Professor Andre McIntyre, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to be able to attend the webinar, Indonesia Indigenous Food Revolution, Opportunities and Challenges, and Ibu Hilman uh, here, Ibu Helianti Hilman as the speaker of the webinar. This, uh, this event is of importance where Indonesia and Australia put a lot of uh, efforts to strengthen uh, trade cooperation, in particular after the entry into force of the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership in July 2020. I never stop referring to SIPA agreement when uh, we discuss about trade, for the agreement provides abundant opportunities for business sector like Ibu uh, Helianti to maximize the benefits such as the eliminations of import tariff from both countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia and Australia shared vision on the importance of nutritious food and food security. The UN Sustainable Development Goal stipulates the commitment of all participating countries, including Indonesia and Australia, to achieve the goal of ending poverty, ending hunger, achieving food security, and improving nutrition. The implementation of those agreements will not come into fruition without the cooperation and support from the public, including from the private sectors. And today, we have seen the significance of Ibu Helianti and her Jafara work in ensuring food security, poverty uh, uh, eradication through provision of healthy and nutritious food in sustainable manner. While some people are still thinking about the issue of uh, food security, Ibu Helianti and Jafara came up with concrete innovation to bring back local and Indonesian food into global market in sustainable manner. There are uh, challenges that Indonesian food uh, industry is facing, such as the quality control, the quality sustainability, and fulfilling the global standard when it comes to food safety. For many small farmers, in particular from developing countries, the ability to fulfill the safety standard, including labeling, is the important issue that needs to be addressed so they can actively participate in the global uh, value chain. I should say that uh, Jafara is very responsive to the global trend in food industry. Where, uh, with your adaptive response to global food trend industry, as, uh, as well as your vision to bring food uh, which are healthy and environmentally friendly, taking into consideration of traceability in the production process, uh, you will have more comparative advantage in Australian market and in global market. On behalf of the government of Indonesia, I would like to express thanks and high appreciation to Jafara for your tremendous efforts in introducing, in introducing local Indonesian food products into global market. I wish you all the success for your endeavors. And it is not fair I don't, uh, if I don't mention the huge contribution from Monas Herb uh, Faith Indonesian Engagement Center, because through your platform and this platform, we can promote the Japara product to reach its greater Australian consumer. Once again, thank you very much for your entire uh, effort and bringing, in bringing Indonesia and Australia relations even closer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ibo. And in very uncanny Indonesian fashion, we finished at exactly seven o'clock, which is quite extraordinary. So well done, everybody. It's been such a pleasure to have all of you. Uh, welcome. And I love, Helianti, that you've got your background, a new background there, which I think is showcasing some of the amazing produce. So from all of us here at Monash and in Melbourne and in Australia, uh, and from the rest of the participants from around the world, thank you so much, uh, Ibo. And, and hopefully one day we can all come and visit you and, and try some of the yes. fabulous food. Yeah. Please so thank you, everybody. Sampai okay, jumpa. Thank you. Bye. Sampai jumpa.